Yes, she's a gatekeeper and a hater. She's also God's favorite princess and the most interesting girl in the world. The appeal of a pretty goth woman with religious trauma is just too great, but she was the most romanced companion amongst those who'd finished the game for a reason. Shadowheart, also lovingly referred to as Shart, is more than just a pretty face though. Just like the other companions, she has an insightful story to tell with a lot of nuance, and that's what I want to unpack today. My name is Shadowheart, loyal servant of Shah, goddess of darkness and loss. There is little more I can tell you than that. My lady Shah tasked me with a mission of such secrecy that I surrendered great swathes of my memory in order to safeguard the knowledge of it. All I know is that I must bring the artifact I hold to Baldur's Gate, and that nothing can stand in my way. My goddess is watching. Shadowheart is the daughter of darkness. She is a worshiper of Shar. For those who didn't know about Shar before playing this game, she is the goddess of darkness, both literally and metaphorically. She is also the evil sister to the goddess of the moon, Saloon. Shar has a bit of a rep for being not that great, and that extends to her followers as well. Do we see where this is going yet? <laughs> this is true for D&D in general, not just Baldur's Gate 3, so there's some understanding that puts more of the game into perspective. If you were also initially confused on the dialogue options when Shadowheart reveals who her god is. Listen, I play D&D, but like in the bard way, I only play bards and my group usually just vibes. We don't actually know all the rules of the game, nor do we know all of the lore surrounding <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons and the Forgotten Realms. So despite being familiar with the mechanics of certain aspects, there's a lot of lore in this game that I have just walked completely blind into, and I'm sure many other players of the game have as well. But it's not too difficult to pick up on the fact that Shadowheart's dilemma here is tied to this evil god that she has devoted her life to. Oh, before we get into the meat of things, I have not personally romanced Shadowheart yet. I'm still trying to claw my way out of Astarian's grasp. So the main focus of this video will be how her story plays out when you have a platonic relationship with her. I know her romance can be greatly affected by certain story beats, but overall, I've gathered that romancing her does not impact or change her overall story as much as other characters like Astarian, where you gain more insight that is very important to understanding his story if you romance him. So that's that's where I'm coming from. You actually first meet Shadowheart prior to Act 1, in the tutorial level of the game. She's one of the two origin characters you actually see on the Nautiloid. She's trapped in a pod, one much like the pod you were able to emerge from at the start. She begs for your help, and you have the option to tell her you'll save her or leave her behind entirely. If you tell her you'll save her, you get a clue to mess with the device next to her pod. I imagine the vast majority of players did save Shadowheart. You don't have to, but like, why wouldn't you? After exploring a bit, learning that some of the pods will transform the captive and solving the puzzle of the device next to Shadowheart's pod, you will be able to free her, finally, <laughs> and add another member to your party. It's no longer just you and Lazel. She's pretty easy to get along with as long as you don't ask too many questions, unless you're a Githyanki or playing a Lazel origin. For those of us unfamiliar with the Gith at large, Shadowheart comes off as a bit of an ass at best and racist at worst complete with distrust for a person based on nothing more than their race and heritage. However, it has been explained to me that the Gith culturally hold a bit of a superiority complex and are very aggressive towards anyone who isn't a Gith Yankee. A friend of mine who is much more well versed in just Dungeons and Dragons lore told me that the Gith were like Dungeons and Dragons versions of Nazis. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on YouTube, but we'll We'll find out. <laughs> Love censorship. 
So Shadowheart's attitude here is a bit more wariness based on a history of aggression, more so than her being a hater for nothing more than just being a bigot. That's a different issue though with fantasy settings in general and not the point of discussion for this video. I did just want to bring it up to defend the biggest flaw that my friends always point out when talking about Shadowheart. If there's one thing I'm gonna do in these character analysis videos is I'm going to defend the hell out of whoever it's about, alright? <laughs> Shadowheart does no wrong. <laughs> She's the point of focus for today. Other than that though, the first impression of Shadowheart is that she is a pretty cute goth girl with an air of mystery. She reaches back into the pod for a strange device that she does not want to talk about. If you push her for answers, she grows irritated with you and will not share. But she is willing to work with you still, and seems to appreciate your presence, which is always- it always feels kinda nice. <laughs> After fighting your way through the Nautiloid, reaching the helm, and activating the transponder, you'll find yourself waking up on a beach just a few feet away from Shadowheart. And because this video is about Shadowheart, we will skip over how I oftentimes like to skip her to get a starry in first so that she does not have to witness me making objectively bad and dumb choices in who I trust. But going back to Shart, she's laid out on the beach unconscious. You can either wake her or try to steal the artifact she carries. Waking Shadowheart is the nicer thing to do though, and she'll express gratitude for you saving her on the ship earlier. One thing, just before we go. I wanted to thank you again for freeing me. It would have been all too easy for you to run right past my pod, but you didn't. I'll remember that. Shadowheart is really neat in the sense that she acknowledges what you've done for her right away with a level of sincerity and appreciation that most of us recognize as a nice and appropriate response, making her come across as a better person right off the bat than the likes of Astarian or Lazelle, who both approach you with a level of caution and aggression that is often read as mean when it's maybe not exactly their intent, especially in the case of Lazelle. <laughs> Shadowheart then makes the assumption that the two of you will be working together to find a cure for the tadpoles in your brain. She doesn't need to be asked to join you, she doesn't drop hints, she makes herself a part of your group, likely because you helped her before and she worked with you on the Nautiloid, so it's safe to assume on her part that she would be welcome to continue working with you once more. And besides, the two of you need each other. It's scary to face the horrors alone, and while she isn't aware of how wild your stories are about to become, she's right. You do need her, and she needs you. Her radiant damage is just unmatched in the Shadow Cursed Lands. You can tell her, though, that you do not want to work together, but unless you're doing a solo, no-party run for a challenge, that's just objectively a bad idea. I do find it interesting though that she's the only companion that you can't tell from the get-go to wait at your camp. She's your ride or die at the start of the game, more or less. I'm not sure how things play out if you do not save her from the pod. I've heard if you don't save Shadowheart, she's not going to be on the beach, but will show up later on in the grove. All I know for certain is that when you do save her, she thanks you and says she'll remember that. And as she says this, you get Shadowheart approval pop up, which indicates to me that you have the option to not save her, but still get her as a companion later. I just have too much empathy, and even in a video game, I have a hard time making the mean choices, <laughs> which is hell for my evil dark urge run that I've started. But all this to say, I always help her, because why wouldn't I? But I am acknowledging that if you don't help her, her story might play out a little bit differently, so now that we're all aware that I'm aware that there's going to be a difference that I just don't know about. From here on out, Shadowheart is pretty easy to please, but also easy to displease. Basically, anytime you show friendship or kindness towards Lazelle, Shadowheart disapproves, at least at first. Shadowheart is very middle of the road when it comes to morality. 
She's not as disapproving of your bleeding heart tendencies like Astarian is, but she's not as outwardly approving of heroic deeds like Will. But she does appreciate your kindness and your ability to get things done without turning to senseless violence. Overall, she likes when you can stand your ground and when you help those in need. She even is chill with you accepting Astarian's apology for almost killing you. So, like, she's a girly that gets it. <laughs> I will say Shadowheart is amongst the companions that are easier to get along with on the surface. As long as you don't ask too many questions, she's pretty nice. Albeit a bit snarky and pretty chill to be around. Compared to the flirtatious theatrics of Astarian, the aggressively blunt nature of Lazelle, or the long-winded quirkiness of Gale. So it's easy to see why Shadowheart is so many people's favorites. Just don't push her to share more than she wants to when Shadowheart is down to be besties or more. I know I didn't compare her to Will or Carlac here, but Will and Carlac you tend to get later on once you've developed an attachment to the first group of people you can come across. Um, so that's why I left those two out. Some of us pick our faves really early into the game. But also, for the sake of comparison, Carlac is very sweet, but she has a very big personality, and if you are romancing her, is very aggressive in her interest, and I can see how that can turn people off. And Will, Will is 24. I was 24 once. <laughs> he's, he's a 24-year-old man with, with a uh, overzealous nature to him and he's got this idealistic version of the world and i can see how that can also be off-putting for some people who may be a little bit more jaded or find 24 year olds annoying <laughs> why am i talking about 24 year olds like they're the new 13 i'm not all this to say will is still very inexperienced compared to some of the other members of the game <laughs> in shadow hearts defense though she does not remember much at all. <laughs> all she knows is that she is a worshiper of Shar, and that she's been sent out to retrieve this relic that she must bring back to Baldur's Gate. The rest of the details are unknown to her, so actually answering the questions would be difficult and probably stressful. Generally, people don't take, uh, take well to being told I don't remember and I don't know when asking important questions. So Shadowheart is so real for getting upset when you push her for answers she just quite simply does not have. As you play the game though, it's revealed that the artifact she carries is important, not just to her, but your whole party. This strange device is somehow able to help you and your party not fall into the thrall of the absolute. It protects you from the tadpole in your brain to some extent. If Shadowheart isn't in your party when you get this cutscene at the goblin camp, the device will just magically teleport to you and stay in your inventory. And even if you do have her in this cutscene, it might still end up in your inventory, but if it doesn't, it will later on. <laughs> If you're watching this video, I assume you already know what's up with the artifact, the Astral Prism. Knowing the Emperor resides inside and for some reason has picked you to be the leader and person he'd deal with, it makes sense that the artifact becomes yours, more or less. Either way, Shadowheart is grateful to have the artifact and is pretty much go with the flow when it comes to the device basically picking you as a favorite. When you bring it up with her, she's like, yeah, I don't really know what that's about, but like, it's yours now. <laughs> Let's just keep going on this adventure. And you know what? She's so real for that. Like, what can she possibly do about that? Absolutely nothing. And she's aware of that and she's just rolling with it. She's so real. <laughs> At some point after the incident on the bridge, Lazel confronts Shadowheart about the artifact she carries. It's apparently a gith relic and Lazel wants answers and to fight Shadowheart. It might be a little bit of her love language, but also like, it looks like this random half elf <laughs> just stole a Gith Yankee relic. That's really a big deal. So like, I understand where she's coming from. Shart is willing to entertain the fight, threatening Lazel and even sneaking up on her in the middle of the night, knife to her throat and tales of how she'll pretty much get away with murder. 
Honestly, this whole thing seems a bit charged. These two are very toxic, Yuri, and I will not be swayed on that point. They want to kiss one another so bad it makes them look stupid. Let me up, and I'll show you. If you push for them to chill out though and stop fighting, Shadowheart is very quick to swap sides, despite being the aggressor and the one holding Lazel at knife point. Shadowheart tries to appeal to Lazel's heart. Can I do that, Lazel? Can I turn my back on you? Never. Thieves aren't afforded such luxury. Loosen the grip on your pride for one blasted moment, won't you? Can she trust her? They aren't friends yet, but diffusing this quarrel is a start. After this, their dynamic becomes less hostile and even less so as Lazel's personal story plays out. It's also kind of fun how Lazel kind of respects Shadowheart for that display of aggression and being able to one-up Lazel. So like, do with that what you will. <laughs> I do think it's funny how quickly Shadowheart folds. She's the main aggressor, but is the first to drop that and beg for peace. I do understand she was doing what she felt she must to survive and complete this really important mission that she was sent on. And like, Lazel is a seasoned fighter, whereas Shadowheart is likely less experienced in combat. I mean, she's a cleric. Clerics are usually support in a team, typically. Um, <laughs> so it's safe to assume that Shadowheart cannot hit as hard as Lazel. So in order to secure her survival, she'd need to outsmart Lazel, sneak up on her in her sleep. So I can't really fault Shadowheart here. It was smart. But given how easy it was to talk her down, I think that speaks volumes for Shadowheart's true nature. We've seen before that she approves of you avoiding unnecessary violence. So she does value keeping the peace. It's a stretch to call her a pacifist, but she does have some pacifistic tendencies. Maybe that's why she misses so often in combat. Yeah, it's a character choice and not a user error. I know the real reason is because usually when she misses, it's because like the cantrip is using one of her lower stats to cast. So the odds are just stacked against her. Justice for Shart. Stop hounding her for missing her shots in battle. Just use what she's good at. <laughs> Throughout Act 1, Shadowheart is mostly chilling. She's worried about the tadpole in her brain, and she's got her pre-tadpole quest as well. However, her worldview is not being challenged. Well, other than when it comes to Lazel, specifically. Um, <laughs> but that's not a part of Shadowheart's, like, overarching character story. She'll make comments about how horrible Saloon is, and when she confesses to being a follower of Char, a lot of the responses you can give her are pretty tame and even nice. The worst thing you can do is kind of tell her that you don't care. You do get disapproval for telling her this, which was wild to me, because I, I assumed it was more like a, hey bud, I don't care who you worship, I love you all the same, but I don't think she took it that way when I told her that. <laughs> But she does appreciate it when you meet her with understanding and an open mind. After defeating the goblin camp and in turn saving the tieflings, Shadowheart is doing pretty well. She's not upset about being considered a hero, and she feels really good about what you all have done. She admits she never really gave much thought to the tieflings, or refugees in general, or people in need. It sounds like she's led a fairly privileged life where those who needed help just weren't on her mind. However, I do believe this is because she spent most of her life in survival mode in the Sharin cult. You don't know much about her past at this point in the game, but I think it's a safe assumption to make about her. And at the very worst, she was just very sheltered and didn't know a lot about the world. <laughs> she also gives off sheltered vibes. <laughs> If you are choosing to romance Shadowheart, you have your first opportunity here at the party to get her Act 1 romance scene. I guess technically you could trigger this sooner with high approval, but most of us are not doing that, especially on a first playthrough. I've only been able to trigger a romance scene before the party with Gale and Astarian, 
but I've not really tried with anybody else. Um, and that is because I speedrun a starting approval and Gale is just Gale. And I think technically I've been able to speedrun Lazel approval. I just never picked the option to ask if she was looking at me different because it felt rude when I didn't know that was like the trigger to her romance scene. <laughs> anyway, Shadow Hearts Romance is very sweet. It's a bit of a slow burn compared to some of the others, which the only thing I mean by that is there's no sex on the first date. The two of you meet on a cliff with a bottle of wine to share. The two of you talk and she wishes to get to know you better. Something about you that isn't related to the mess y'all have found yourselves in. She reveals that she may not have anything to share though, and she also shares how Shar followers will sacrifice their memories as a part of their practice. Most of her is lost to herself. The two of you drink until you pass out, but when you awake, the two of you can have a sweet moment, flirting and eventually you can kiss her if you'd like. She'll ask if it hurts, which some have interpreted to mean she bit you, and to be fair, Shadowheart is seen to be a bit kinky. I've been told. <laughs> and others, though, interestingly enough, have interpreted her asking if it hurts as her asking if the kiss had inflicted pain from Char onto you. Honestly, I'm not sure what camp I'm in for this. I mean, she literally approves of you getting the shit beat out of you by the uh, BDSM Lovitar follower. Lovidar? Lovidar. I think it's pronounced lo <laughs> Lovidar. I always say it as Lovitar. It's absolutely incorrect. Um, I love mispronouncing things. <laughs> but it's not too far out of the realm of possibility for Char to hurt you for daring to love Shadowheart or hurt you as a way to retain control over Shadowheart and her, her heart, more or less, her loyalty. Either way, the scene is sweet and it's tender and it's so different from some other romances in this game, which I think this difference goes a long way to characterize Shadowheart's base personality. She's sweet, she's caring, yet cautious. She genuinely wants to get to know you. She's not just looking for physical satisfaction or protection. She is interested in you as a person. That's not to say the other companions are not interested in you as a person, but some of the companions either have ulterior motives at first or are looking for physical pleasures in your company pretty early on. Not that there's anything wrong with that, it's just a difference in approach to companionship. As you continue to build your relationship and trust with Shadowheart, she becomes more willing to share what she does know about herself with you. She'll open up about her fears and what she can remember about her past. Shadowheart is afraid of wolves because the only thing she can remember from her childhood is encountering a wolf in the woods one night. This is also when she was saved by her local Sharan church, brought in and taught the ways of the Dark Lady. We do not know her exact age when this happened, but it is safe to assume she was probably around like 10 to 12. This is a huge deal for her, and her sharing her memory with you is a giant step in your relationship, whether it's platonic or romantic. It shows that she trusts you a lot. She's being vulnerable and upfront about the vulnerability for the first time. We'll talk deeper about this part of her past later, but with what she does know about it, we can see she feels a great deal of gratitude towards Shar herself. Shadowheart is devoted to her lady because she feels her lady is devoted to her. Shadowheart latches on to you after you save her life on the Nautiloid, much like how she latched on to Shar. She's loyal to you and works to help you as well. Yeah, there's the added dynamic of the two of you still needing to work together to solve the tadpole problem, but she sticks by you. Even when you make objectively bad and horrible choices that go against her morals. Some of the companions fall in the more morally gray area, and some are so set in their morals that they will leave your party if you do certain terrible things. Shadowheart, though, has generally pretty good morals. She feels guilt over the bad things that your group does, but she still sticks by you throughout it. 
If you choose to betray the Grove and lead Minthara and the goblins to attack the Tieflings and the Druids, Shadowheart is miserably guilty about it, just like me for real for real. <laughs> However, she won't admit to it, and when you call her out on it, she deflects, stating that Char is pretty chill with this kind of thing, so she should be too. But she's not. Shadowheart's mind is drenched in drink and confusion. She's killed before, enjoyed it even, but now an ill, twisting feeling lingers in her gut, one that has nothing to do with the wine. Guilty? Ridiculous. What's that to be guilty for? My goddess smiles on such bloodshed. Just let me enjoy a drink in peace. Shadowheart, despite her attempts at cruelty under the guidance of Shar, is such a kind-hearted person. She has a conscience, and she feels great regret for things that Lazel or Astarian wouldn't think too much about. Another day, another act of cruelty because the world is terrible, is not enough justification for her. It's almost as if Shadowheart has this internal battle between herself and how she should be as a follower of Shar. Uh... Act 2 is where Shadowheart becomes the main character. She gains plot armor in the sense that she feels some sort of protection against the shadow curse that plagues the land, and a good chunk of Act 2 is directly related to Shar and Shadowheart's desire to become a Dark Justicier, which are essentially Shar's most devoted warriors. It's the highest honor for a follower of Shar to become a Dark Justicier, so it's a huge deal to Shadowheart, who'd previously been shot down and told she'd never be able to do such a thing by her mother superior back at her home cloister. Her home enclave? I don't know. I wrote enclave in the script, but then I noticed while replaying some Act 3 stuff, they always refer to it as a cloister, but like, I don't think it matters. Her home church. <laughs> so how does one become a Dark Justicier? Well, Shadowheart must complete a series of trials called the Gauntlet of Shar. You'll find this in a Sharan temple hidden beneath the mausoleum, and this just so happens to be directly related to the Night Song quest that you've been asked to help Balthazar with. So it's directly tied to the main plot of the game, and you cannot avoid it. Whereas other character story arcs or story beats can be pretty easily avoided if you just didn't want to mess with it. The trials themselves don't matter all that much in the whole grand scheme of things. They're just fun little mini games that I personally enjoyed and also quickly figured out how to cheat more or less. However, I do think it's notable to mention just how devoted Shadowheart is to Shar during all of this. She's out here doing something she'd only ever dreamed of having the opportunity to do, following what she thinks is the highest form of worship to her dark goddess. Shadowheart feels that she owes her life to Shar, and now she's finally able to devote herself even more so than she already was. Maybe making up for all that she feels Shar has done for her. Saving her from the wolf in the woods one night, giving her a place to belong, a home when she was allegedly an orphan, tender mercies from the Lady of Loss. After completing the Sharan Olympics, it's time to take the gang down to the Shadowfell, where you will encounter the Night Song. A woman who's been held captive for a century to grant one man immortality. That's right, the Night Song is not a relic or a device, but is in fact a living, breathing person. But not just any living, breathing person, no, no, no. The Night Song is Dame Aelin, the daughter of Saloon, Shar's niece. <laughs> this is Shar's niece, <laughs> and Shar wants her dead. Shadowheart must drive a spear through Dame Aelin, killing her for Shar. However, it's not that simple. Anyone who's playing with any ounce of empathy isn't going to make that decision lightly. As the encounter goes on, you have the opportunity to persuade Shadowheart into not killing the Night Song, or you can push her into doing it. 
However, the most interesting thing to me and the most important thing for Shadowheart's character here is the outcome when you let Shadowheart make this decision completely on her own without persuading her to do anything. I will say if you try to persuade her, like, she gets really aggressive with you and, like, you might brawl it out. <laughs> That's the vibes it gives. Um, but when left to her own devices, Shadowheart struggles with doing what she thinks is expected of her. She clings to Char's teachings, Char's words, Char's desires, but there's hesitation, uncertainty. Dame Aelin is able to talk Shadowheart down, more or less. She strikes a chord with her. Aelin not only shares the um, real vibes of being a dark justice seer, it's misery, misery, and pain, and nothing else. <laughs> Aelin also has information on Shadowheart's past, things that she can't remember and things that Aelin most definitely should not know about. This promise of answers is enough for Shadowheart to falter in her belief and do what's right. She chooses on her own to throw the spear off into the abyss and spare Dame Aelin, defying Shar in favor of her own heart and her own life. You could make the argument that it was a selfish thing done purely for the information because Shadowheart has not openly cared about the misery that Shar promises her. And Shadowheart does put a lot of emphasis on what Dame Aelin claims to know. However, I think that's just a factor or an excuse that she's clinging to in order to justify defying Shar. I believe that if Shadowheart didn't have any doubts for Shar and didn't feel any guilt for what she was expected to do, Dame Aelin would not have been able to talk her down more or less. She wouldn't have had the time. And the whole way down to where the Night Song was waiting, Shadowheart was more or less hyping herself up, almost as if she wasn't sure she could do what was expected of her, or that it would take a great toll on her. It's also worth noting, if you did want Shadowheart to kill the Night Song and become DJ Shart, you pretty much have to force her hand. Unless you're playing an evil route from the start, I guess? I've been told that she will sometimes choose to kill Aelin on her own, but I have never seen that happen. I've always let Shadowheart choose for herself. Although as of writing and recording this, I've only made it this far in the game four times. However, I have let her choose every single time and she is four for four on not killing Aelin. I will admit most of my playthroughs have been very good aligned, I'll let you know if it changes when my evil dark urge gets this far, although I'm probably gonna push her to become a DJ shark. That's beside the point. Shadowheart does not want to kill Aelin, plain and simple, when you leave it up to her. This blatant betrayal of Shar choosing an act of kindness even if it was selfish, choosing the chance of happiness over the guaranteed misery that would follow her as a dark justicier. It's increasingly clear, at least to me, what lies in Shadowheart's heart, despite how she was molded. At her core, Shadowheart is just a woman who wants to be happy. She's a woman who wants to do what she thinks is best. She's a woman that wants to avoid hurting others when possible. She's a woman who seeks the light things in life. And all of these things stand in direct opposition to Shar. After defeating Kethric, the main boss for Act 2, Shadowheart is finally able to speak with Dame Aelin about what she knows. This is when Dame Aelin reveals that Shadowheart's perception of her life was entirely wrong. She's not an orphan, Shard did not save her, and her parents still live. Shadowheart was brought up as a follower of Saloon, and as a rite of passage, Salunite children are sent into the woods at night to find their way back, except she never made it back. The wolf from her memory was actually her father, and we can assume that he was only following her as a wolf to make sure that she was safe. She and her father were attacked by a group of Sharans. Shadowheart was kidnapped and taken in, 
broken and remolded to be a devout follower of Shar. Her memories taken and warped to fit the narrative that would benefit Shar. Shadowheart's very perception of reality had been torn apart and rebuilt by the Dark Goddess. Or like, people working for her. Semantics. <laughs> Shadowheart's indoctrinated into this cult-like following at a young age and has spent the past 40 or something years like this, betraying her heart for the sake of her dark lady. It's now a great time to mention that Shadowheart's theme is overcoming the cycles of abuse as it ties into religious trauma. I think anyone that knows Shadowheart and has played the game knows that Shadowheart is all about religious trauma. But how does that tie in to the overall themes of the game when it comes to abuse. Despite what you may personally believe about religion and spirituality, it cannot be denied that people can and do use religion as a tool to manipulate and harm others. Religion can also be oppressive and destructive for certain groups of people as well. I can only speak for Christianity since that's what I'm most familiar with and if you couldn't tell by how I sound, I do live in America so that is like the main religion causing problems where I live. <laughs> but how many times do we see people finally leave these fundamentalist cults and have to more or less relearn how to be a person? Within these groups, reality is warped and stretched to fit what benefits the person or people in power. Queer people are demonized for just trying to exist. The social landscape is so rigid and stifling. If you don't fit the perfect mold, then there's something deeply wrong with you and somehow that translates to you not believing hard enough or not being a good person or just not doing religion well. You've got a bad grade in religion, something that is possible to do and it should be avoided that was sarcasm if you couldn't tell and if you dare to question these belief systems or this hierarchy or this social construct that you're being brought up in it's like the end of the world you're ridiculed talked down to and used as an example for sin all while those who used to be friends and family either drop you or devote themselves to bringing you back into the cult or religion. Cult was a strong word to use there, probably. <laughs> it's not that different for Shadowheart in the Sharon circles. And just like many people faced with the decision of abandoning the damaging environment in which they were raised, Shadowheart must choose to find her own path in life, leaving the cult she was raised in in favor of learning who she is and breaking away from the cruelties of the organization. Or she could continue the harm that had been done to her, leveling up in culty religion and being put into a position to basically put that same judgment and mistreatment onto others that was previously thrown onto her. Just with the added bonus of having to make a literal human sacrifice. Human meaning person with thoughts and feelings and not like the technical human since Aelin is an Asimar. Just... Whenever I say someone is human in a Baldur's Gate video, just assume I mean in the philosophical sense. But choosing not to sacrifice Aelin and turning her back on Shar brings many, many consequences onto Shadowheart. She's held in the Shadowfell when you guys leave and tortured by Shar for daring to defy her. She describes it as the worst thing she's ever been through and it felt like it went on forever. That's rough. <laughs> Shadowheart is cast out and told that she's no longer welcome and she no longer has a place amongst those that she'd once considered friends and family. She's now a target for other Shar followers and an example of what happens when you leave the cult or religion. <laughs> for some people, cult and religion are like kind of one and the same. I don't really know how to refer to the Sharin group because it feels very culty. But like, maybe you can make the argument that all religion feels kind of culty and I'm being unfair towards Shar. I don't know. It feels culty to me. And Baldur's Gate 3 does talk a lot about cults. So... Another common thing in people with religious trauma that is seen in Shadowheart's character is all of the self-doubt. 
the constant push and pull between what she was taught is right and what she feels is right. You see this as she struggles with making the decision to kill or spare Aelin. The way she keeps this sacrifice a secret from you, almost as if she knew it was wrong and you'd try to stop her from doing what her goddess asked of her. You see it in the way that she's challenged with accepting that Saloon is not that bad when interacting with Isabel earlier in Act 2 and accepting her blessing. We get to watch Shadowheart's worldview change to match her heart in real time. We see the pain she experiences as she learns that what she thought she knew was all lies. We watch the cloth lift from her eyes as she learns that her parents are still alive and being tortured by Shar. Aelin puts it best when she says there is a bond of pain between Shadowheart and her parents, much like how there was a bond of pain between Kethric and Aelin. As Act 2 comes to a close, so does Shadowheart's love and devotion for Shar and the life she once led. Unless you choose the Dark Justicia route, in which case, Shadowheart becomes worse and even more devoted to Shar and places Shar above everything else even growing distant in her relationships with you and the party, which I'm told is even more of a jarring withdrawal if you are romancing her. Which I guess makes sense. She sacrificed her heart for Shar, and at that point might as well give, give it your all? Otherwise, that sacrifice would amount to nothing and it would be a waste. So, and also it's my understanding that like people who follow Shar aren't really like supposed to fall in love and do all that fun stuff and like have show affection. It seems a little taboo to the Sharins because they're all about pain and suffering and misery and endless darkness. So she can't love you, even if she wants to. Shadowheart starts Act 3 with a new look. She grew her bangs out a bit, and if you don't have her become a dark dress this year, she dyes her hair white. It's super cute, and even though she's unsure about it, I always tell her she looks very pretty. The visual cues of Shadowheart abandoning Char go deeper than that, though. Yes, it's a bit silly that Shadowheart dyes her hair white, a color that in the game seems to be associated with Saloon, but it's also a visual indicator of the identity crisis that Shadowheart is currently going through now that her world has been turned upside down. For so long, Shar had been such an integral part of Shadowheart's identity. Even more so once you learned the name Shadowheart was one she picked to honor Shar. But she doesn't have that devotion anymore, so what's a girl to do amidst a crisis? Change the one thing she has control over. Her appearance. It's an attempt to feel like she has control in her life when everything is so out of control. That's what's going on here. I'm saying that as if it's a straight up fact because that's just how people are. <laughs> Luckily for our um, new ex Sharon Shadowheart though, members of the Sharon Enclave and Baldur's Gate are not willing to bring her back into the fold. Unluckily though, they seem to feel a bit hostile towards her. At least at first. When exploring the refugee camp in Rivington, if Shadowheart is on your party, a random guy who is also a merchant will call out to her, requesting you speak with him. When interacting with him, he is angry. <laughs> He's so mad that she dared to show her face, admitting she caused him to lose a bet. Apparently, the members of the cloister were taking bets on if she'd hide out forever and never return, or if she would dare to show her face in Baldur's Gate. I don't know about you, but this does not sound like normal behavior for a group of people Shadowheart once considered friends and family. I don't think these people ever cared about her, beyond the fact that she was also a follower of Shar. Now we have no way of knowing how many people were betting on this, but it's clear that people are unhappy she's back in the city. For the most part though, Shadowheart doesn't have a whole lot going on in Act 3 until you go and confront the Sharn Cloister at the House of Grief. Act 3 is fun in the sense that a good chunk of it is side quests and tying up all the loose ends of each of the companion's personal storylines before 
confronting the Absolute directly. Shadowheart, though, did most of her character arc in Act 2, so she's mostly just chilling until it's ready for her grand finale. However, once you do finally make your way down to the House of Grief, Shadowheart is finally able to put her arc to a close and make some progress on saving her parents. You all waltz in and she's ushered to a back room where her heart will be judged. This is where she first encounters her mother superior, a figurehead of the cloister that is entrusted with raising and teaching those who seek to join Char. Or were kidnapped into it. I don't know how many people had Shadowheart's origin story, but I guarantee she's not the only one. <laughs> After this encounter, you're allowed down into the actual enclave, cloister, whatever, where your party will come face to face with Mother Superior, Viconia Devere. She'll try to bargain with you, release Shadowheart to her and the Astral Prism, and you'll be able to count on Viconia and the cloister for help against the Absolute. However, that would be essentially trading Shadowheart's life for a bit of help you can find elsewhere. It's not a fair bargain. Viconia Devere plans on killing Shadowheart, using her as an example of what happens to traitors. Traitors is a strong word for somebody just leaving a religious sect, in my opinion. But... The Shar Shar feels more like a cult, which you know, calling a ex cult member a traitor is very good for um, making the people still in the cult feel like they have to stay in the cult. It's manipulation. That's all that is. Um, love that for her. Anyway, if you're here, odds are you're not there to return Shadowheart or turn her in to gain some allies. You've got plenty of those already. You're here to help save her parents and regain what was taken from her. I don't know who is waltzing in here with Shadowheart to complete her quest and making the decision to turn her in just for some lousy allies. Like who is doing that? Why? Why would you? I mean, if you've done it and you have like an actual good reason beyond the, uh, my character was evil and it just fit. Please let me know. I'm genuinely curious. Shadowheart is antagonized for the decision that she has made, belittled in her disbelief and treated like an idiot child for taking her life into her own hands. She's shamed for turning her back on the cloister and for choosing her family over her family. What ensues is what I think is one of the hardest, if not the hardest fight in the whole game. I struggled more in this fight than I did the actual final battle. And uh, it does also honestly feels like the enemies are focusing on killing Shadowheart more so than anyone else in your party. And whenever one of my like team members gets focused like that, it's just harder in general to keep people alive versus when the focus is spread out. It does make sense narratively though that Shadowheart would be the main focus. Their fight is not with you. You aren't the traitor here necessarily. Yes, you've become an enemy by standing by Shadowheart, but she's the one they're really after here. You're just some random guy off the street. But once the fight is over, you're finally able to figure out where Shadowheart's parents are and do something about it. After finding your way into the room that's just past where the fight took place, you're met with Shadowheart's parents hung up like sacrificial lambs stuck in place for all of these years. Decades even. They're happy to see Shadowheart alive and, well, happy. Happy to see that she's found her way out of Char's grasp. Happy to see that she's doing well, all things considered. Her mother, though has not held up as well as her father against the tortures. Um, also, her mother is a human that is likely nearing the end of her lifespan, so like that's also probably a factor, and it makes sense. After the bittersweet reunion, Shadowheart must make a difficult choice. If Shadowheart wants to fully 
claw her way away from Shar. And curing the incurable wound on her hand. Oh, yeah, um, I don't think I brought that up in this video. Shar gave Shadowheart a wound on her hand that she uses to torture her. If Shadowheart wanted to sever that bond, she'd have to sacrifice her parents. Saving her parents would damn her to a lifetime of being bound to the Dark Lady. She's faced with sacrificing her parents to leave an abusive religion or sacrificing herself to keep her parents alive. A choice many people symbolically have to make when making the decision to leave the religion they were raised in, more or less. Maybe not actually choosing to kill your parents in order to gain freedom over your life, but more so in the sense that oftentimes people leaving an abusive religion that they were raised in may cause a rift between them and their parents, and oftentimes that rift can't just simply be patched up, leaving a person with the choice of taking their life into their own hands and healing from what abuse was done to them in the name of that religion, and in turn losing their parents and their parents' influence in their life, losing the comfort of a parental figure who will be there for them, or keeping those comforts and sacrificing themselves just to keep the peace and staying in the toxic environment that the religion had created for them. It's a horrible decision, and one that Shadowheart is not too keen on making. She asks you for your input, and her father pleads for her to sacrifice them and live her life the way that she should. He'd gladly die if it meant that she was free. Her parents love her so much that they would happily die for her. And also, her dad mentions the fact that they will, like, join Saloon in the afterlife and, like, they won't be far. So, like, he's pretty at peace with the idea of dying, just, like, in general. <laughs> um, so it seems to me, like, that's the choice that is framed as, like, the good choice or the better choice. Grant her parents the peaceful death that will allow their souls to move on and give them the hopes of being reunited in the afterlife under Saloon's blessing. It's heartbreaking and terrible, but it's the choice that would allow Shadowheart the best chance at healing and growth. The choice to end her parents' suffering, sacrificing them to sever her bond with Shar, is the one Shadowheart makes when you leave the choice up to her. Telling her that she doesn't need you to tell her what is right. I wish we got this level of support and open-endedness with other characters like Will. I hate being the one that has to decide if a character is going to sacrifice their parents or not. <laughs> Weird that it happens twice in this game and I only get to tell one of them that it's up to them. It's a hard choice to make, but it's the one that leads Shadowheart to her good ending. It's the start of her healing journey, it's the end of her connection with Shar, and she she may have still lost her parents, but she took them back from Shar. Afterwards, you can explore the Enclave to learn more about how Shadowheart used to live, and it's like kind of grim in like the normal oppressive bad religion way but the silver lining here is meeting nocturne shadowheart's friend and possibly lover from the cloister i think they were girlfriends i don't have my evidence like at the top of my head but i do know there is evidence um <laughs> nocturne is a cool woman who despite it all still shows love and support for shadowheart even if she herself does not feel comfortable leaving Shar, Nocturne actually says she's not strong enough to, which implies to me that a part of her wants to, but she's not totally ready. Like, she's not sold on the Lady of Loss, but it's all she's got, and she can't give that up. Not, not yet, at least. Probably how Shadowheart felt for a while, I would assume. It is fun, though, talking to Nocturne. We get to learn more about what Shadowheart was like before we met them, and what her friendship or relationship with Nocturne looks like. The way that Shadowheart stuck up for Nocturne against bullies, and the way she had a flair for the dramatic. It sounds like Nocturne and Shadowheart may have been the oddballs of the cloister, but they had each other. And it's nice to know that despite all of the horrors, Shadowheart had someone that she could depend on, and a genuine connection with somebody in this cloister. To wrap up her arc, the next long rest after this whole encounter, Shadowheart takes you out to a saloon worshipping site or like a temple or something. She wanted to see if she felt anything. 
All the puzzle pieces of her life have finally fallen together, and the whole picture is tainted with the loss of her parents, and the full weight of everything she has lost. She's mourning her parents and her responsibility in that decision. She'll cry, finally letting out all of that emotion, and interestingly enough, she shares that that's the first time she's cried in as long as she remembers, which I know she doesn't remember much, but I think this is less so about like, I don't remember, and more so about the sadness under Char didn't have any happiness to contrast against, so it was just this numb feeling. It wasn't, it wasn't a deep, alive sadness. It was just nothing and numbness and when all you have is misery you get used to it there's nothing to cry about so like shadow hearts alive again good for her i hope she gets over this i also find it fascinating how shadow heart doesn't discard the identity that she's built for herself over the past few decades she knows her birth name now and has a better idea of who she was and is and where she came from but who she's been under Char is just as much a part of her as her origin. Genevelle, Shadowheart, they're both her. And as it's I love I love that the game talks about this. Because sometimes when you go through something, it is very, very easy to create these hard separations in the different versions of yourself. And having that hard separation sometimes makes it a lot harder to heal and just like feel like a stable and unified person not in the disassociative identity kind of way it's different <laughs> i don't know how to describe it very eloquently but it's like this hard separation of self where it's like yeah me from this period and me from this period are different and creating that hard separation makes it ha harder to i guess heal the older versions of yourself more or less you can't heal your inner child if you are denying that that child was you is basically it shadowheart though does have this desire to embrace herself to her fullest all versions of her her past her present she recognizes that she'll need to reconcile with every part of her including the part that was shadowheart and perhaps the name fits her better now than it did before this line could be recognizing the grief that now weighs her down, but it can also be taken as a reference to the light that she's now welcoming into her life. You can't have shadows in total darkness. Just, I don't know if you knew that. You need light sources to cast a shadow. Um, so for so long, she was immersed in the darkness of Char. There were no shadows in her heart. Now though, she's opened up her heart to the lighter things in life, and accepted that her power comes from Saloon. Shadowheart's heart is now home to light and the shadows that are cast within. This pretty much wraps up Shadowheart's story arc. I do want to add though, like one point to the toxic religion point though. If you let Shadowheart become a dark justice -er, she still finds out about her parents and the truth of everything. Except she learns it directly from Char, who then asks her to kill her parents. So, that's wild. Unnecessary cruelty. Char also talks about how Shadowheart's mother may have given birth to her, but it was Char who made her. Char is her mother. That's what she says. The gods in D&D are wild, and holy shit, Char is incredibly manipulative and like just kind of the worst. I understand now why she has such a bad reputation. She's very spiteful too, but like, I think that's a common thing in, I don't know about D&D, but I know like Greek mythology, the gods are very petty and spiteful. And it does feel like a lot of the gods in D&D are also petty and spiteful. Probably just depends on which one you're talking about. Shadowheart's character isn't one that I can directly relate to, but I can see how her story resonates so hard with so many people. However, I think one thing all of us can relate to is the contrast of what we feel is right for us and what is expected of us. Shadowheart is very real in that sense. She's just trying to survive and make sense of her place in the world, and like, honestly, me too. I think that's true for everyone. Like every other character in this game, a huge part of her story is finding her voice and freedom as she stands up against her abuser. 
However, her story is a bit different from some of the other companions in the sense that her bad ending is not giving in to power for the sake of protecting herself from future abuse or becoming like her abuser. No, her bad ending is giving in to her abuser and corrupting herself further for the sake of keeping Shar happy. However, given that her story is more about religious trauma that makes more sense than her becoming a corrupt god or something, she was never meant to mirror Shar, but perhaps she'd have a future in mirroring Viconia de Vere, who also played a huge role in her past mistreatment. I wrote that before I knew how the Dark Justice Year epilogue party went out, but we're about to talk about it. In the epilogue party, we get a good follow-up on what Shadowheart has been up to. If you support her in her path to Vi Shar and start healing, she's got a lot of good updates. She's very excited to see you, and even if you don't romance her, it's so wholesome, and you get to give her a hug, and she's like, let's be besties, and I love her. <laughs> She'll share how she's been exploring the world, and learning new things, and perhaps looking for her place in it still. She'll talk about how she's able to avoid getting caught up in Sharon attacks due to Nocturne. Nocturne is still in the Sharon cult, but she's more devoted to her friend than the Dark Goddess. Nocturne will send Shadowheart letters warning her of plans and future attacks and basically keeping her in the loop so that she's never caught off guard. I think that's really sweet, and things are left on an open-ended note as to whether or not Nocturne will get to leave the cult as well. Shadowheart shares that she has her support and she'll support Nocturne in the decision but at that moment, Nocturne herself is just not ready. And that's okay. That's okay. I love that she has Shadowheart, though, in the future where she might be ready. And that's so slay of them. Shadowheart also talks about seeking out Salunite temples. She mentions the one in Waterdeep, which is, like, the biggest one. So, like, as far as, far as Saloon temples go, that's, like, the anime expo to all the other American conventions, like, that's the big one everyone wants to go to, is my understanding. Um, but she does this to reflect on her parents and where she came from. She doesn't dive into worshipping Saloon like she did with Shar, but Saloon does seem to be a source of comfort for Shadowheart. She's not, like, a, a Saloonite, but she, she has some respect there. When recovering from religious trauma like Shadowheart, it is probably best to take things slow and not just jump headfirst into the next religion if that's the course she wishes to take in the future. Good for her. It's always nice finding something that can do something good for you. But for now, it's enough for Shadowheart to just explore and seek out her place in the world and reflect and just think about herself than it is for her to become a devout worshiper of Saloon. Shadowheart is truly just living her life. However, if you push Shadowheart to become a dark dress to see her, she's no longer living her life. In this, she's still alive. I, as I was saying that, I realized it sounded like I said she was dead. She's alive. Um, <laughs> at the epilogue party, she talks about how Shar's church prospers and how the whole absolute cult thing and the attack from the brain and just Baldur's Gate kind of <laughs> having a terrible time. Um, has created the perfect soil for Shar to flourish. Spreading the message and spreading Shar's twisted beliefs to others who are in very vulnerable parts of their lives, having their homes destroyed, people they care about, maybe killed in the whole everything, caught in the crossfire, the lives turned upside down. Like, these people are suffering, and Shar is swooping in and taking advantage of that. Shadowheart does seem happy, though. We've seen her be worse. She holds a position of power now in the Sharon Cloister. However, this new outlook on life does complicate her feelings towards Viconia de Vere, who I think we still have to kill even if she is a Dark Justice seer. Um, there's a level of understanding, but it's also a bit of wondering. Viconia de Vere was an adversary for Shadowheart, but now she feels like she understands where the hostility was coming from, given the sense that she talks about how Viconia was basically having to groom her replacement. 
And they do use the word grooming there, which I think is very interesting. Because if you are raising somebody to do something, there are different ways you could talk about that. And grooming someone to doing something has a very negative connotation. So I thought that was very fascinating. It's almost as if she feels that she was kind of like stripped down and rebuilt specifically for this but not in like a good way although being stripped down and rebuilt is probably never in a good way but i do think it's interesting that she uses the word grooming there because it's it's a level of acknowledgement of the mistreatment that she went through and the absolutely messed up way she got brought into the sharon cult pretty much shadowheart does seem happy to see you though which is always very slay um she talks about how demanding Shar is and how she's jealous of your adventures because she doesn't get the opportunity to go explore the world. She doesn't get the opportunity to expand her worldview. There's so much that she misses from your old adventure. The simplicity, the, the vibes, the getting to going out there and doing things and experiencing life. She doesn't get to do that anymore. She desperately misses it. Not that she misses like the tadpoles and the absolute and all that, but like... I have a feeling she would do it all again if it meant getting to live. When you ask to hug her, she makes a comment on how you're lucky none of her followers are around to witness her display an act of sincere affection. Something that isn't really allowed for followers of Shar I'm gathering. I'll be honest, Shadowheart does not seem as happy in this ending. Yes, she's not bawling and talking about how terrible her life is, but she... She's not as happy as she could be. Sure, she's accomplished within the cloister and does her best to serve Shar, the very thing that she'd been living for for the past 40 or something years, but there's a level of resigned misery behind her words. She lacks the excitement for life that she has when you support her in defying Shar. She lacks the wonder of exploring and learning new things, although we do still see that desire here. Shadowheart is effectively locked into her responsibility for Shar, and has room for nothing else in her life. A life wholly dedicated to a god that would happily watch the world burn if it meant spiting Saloon. A god whose followers are kidnapped and groomed into being believers. This just, this feels like how... Again, okay, I'm gonna speak about people I do not know personally. But we've all seen the, the, like, the Christian woman who just looks so beaten down and has time for nothing because she has to tend to her, like, six kids. And, like, if, if you live in America or, like, I guess an area where Christianity is the dominant religion, you know exactly who I'm talking about. Or, like, the Girl Defined Girls, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I've heard of them. I've not watched them. But I've seen people talk about, like, just how beaten down and depressing it kind of is when you think about it. That's what this ending for Shadowheart feels like. There's no right or wrong way to play this game, and choosing one ending over the other does not make you a bad person or a superior person. However, it is clear which ending is intended to be the happier one. The good ending, if you will. I want to make this clear because I feel like some people don't get it, especially when talking about Astarian, and I feel like that might extend to other companions in the game. But when I say a good or bad ending in regards to a game like this, I just mean the ending that's intended to be the happier one and the ending that may be a bit more messed up. Not that you're bad for doing the messed up ending. There's a story worth being told in every ending. And for Shadowheart, her story can be one of a woman breaking free from a near lifetime of abuse at the hands of a religious cult or a cautionary tale of a woman giving up everything for a goddess that seeks to keep her beaten down. There's, it's... The good slash bad ending isn't a dictator of morality. It's more of a uh, shorthand to be like, hey, this ending was really happy, or hey, this ending, like, might have some questionable or messed up things going on. Like, they're both good, but in regards to the characters themselves, may not feel as good. It's not a morality thing. I just really want to make that clear. <laughs> anyway, we love Shard out here. She's too kind, even if that kindness is hidden under layers of snarky sarcasm, char and drivel, and the selfish tendencies of man. Shadowheart is honestly really human in her portrayal of morals and kindness. 
yeah, she has them. She definitely has them. But she's not perfect at abiding by them. But when she abandons her morals, we see how she becomes miserable with guilt. Something she wouldn't be suffering with if she was as evil or morally grey as some other companions in the game. I honestly don't think that any of the companions except for maybe Minthara can be described as fully evil though. This party is morally grey at worst, even if that may teeter on a dark shade of grey at times. Shadowheart though, I feel like sits in a version of morally grey that's a lighter shade. Looking at what she approves of, she's pretty peaceful. If not a bit wild and kinky at times, yeah, I I noticed that approval when Abdurak was beating the shit out of my character. Don't think I didn't see that, girl. <laughs> I also have some friends that are romantic her and like I've seen her react to certain things and it's like, huh. You're wild. Good for her. I love that about her. She's so funny. <laughs> But for the most part, she values keeping the peace, and isn't upset over the idea of helping others. She literally is just trying to do what she thinks is best, and I respect that. And I'm sure anyone who has sat through this video probably respects that about her as well. I mean, she is the most popular character to romance for a reason, and I have not seen anyone dislike her. Literally, Shadowheart haters do not exist. I see haters for the other companions, and in some cases, I definitely understand the dislike towards the character, but for Shart, we all love her. God's favorite princess for real. <laughs> anyway, I think this is like the first time I've made it through a video just in general without talking a lot about Astarian, so like, good for me. Anyway, that's my Shadow Heart analysis. I just think she's really nice. She's so kind and I just, I like her a lot. I really do. I gotta romance her one of these days. <laughs> anyway, that's it for me. Um, I don't know which companion I'm doing next, either Lazelle or Will, but I will be covering both of them within the near future, and then we'll play it by ear from there as to whether or not I talk about like Halcyn or Minthara or just whoever. I'm just kind of going with what I feel like doing. Anyway. How many times have I said that's it for me? That's it for me. <laughs> for real. Bye. Thank you for watching this really long video about Shadowheart. <laughs>